This wall cabinet is a project that is about a year in the making and one I'm really excited to share with you guys. This is also the last video in my building tools to build tools to build furniture series. In the previous videos of these series, I've been building my own tools and finally in this video, I'll be able to use all those tools to build a small wall cabinet. So as I work on breaking down this white oak into square component pieces, I want to go back a little over two years and share this photo of me in my garage trying to make my own picture frame. So notice there's no workbench in the corner, no tools on the wall, but I have a big smile on my face because I'm building things with my hands. At this point, I had a strong desire to want to get it into woodworking, but I had one slightly big problem. I couldn't afford modern power tools. We all know woodworking is an expensive hobby and it's pretty frustrating to have these grand ideas of things to build, but not really have a workshop to do it in. At this time, however, I had been watching a lot of woodworking YouTube videos and stumbled upon channels focused more on hand tool woodworking, and pretty soon a vision started to form in my head. I saw that if I could get a plane, a saw, a couple of chisels, and a few other things, I could begin building my own tools to grow my own shop, to where I'd eventually have all these tools I needed to realistically build a piece of furniture. And the best part was that I could probably do all this at a relatively low cost. So with the money problem solved and some plans gifted to me by a friend, I set out to begin making my own tools. Naturally, one of the first tools I made were these winding sticks I'm using here. If you want to dimension and square lumber by hand, you will inevitably need a pair of winding sticks, which happens to be the first tool I built in this series. On one of these sticks are two darker pieces of wood set on the edges of the stick, and the other stick is blank all the way across. By placing them on the edges of the board like so, and looking down the board until one of the dark pieces of wood disappears behind the front piece of the wood, you'll then be able to know if the board is twisted in any way. I knew I was going to be doing a lot of milling boards by hand, so naturally it only made sense that I would make this tool first. So using my winding sticks to get the twist out of the one face of the board, I could then edge joint a side of the board square to the flat face I just planed. Once that was square, I could then use my marking gauge and referencing off this square edge, make a mark at the exact width for the final dimension. This marking gauge also happened to be the second tool I ever made. Unfortunately, I didn't film myself making it, so it would have fit perfectly into the series, but like the winding sticks, a marking gauge is maybe one of the most essential tools in a woodworker's toolbox, and again, only natural that it be one of the first tools I made. So with the second edge square and my piece now to its correct width, I could then move on to planning the remaining face to the correct depth. And here you can see one of the first of many mistakes I had while bidding this project. When I was resawing this long board, I experienced a lot of internal tension in the board and struggled to saw a straight line. As you can see, I ended up cutting a pretty big gouge into the face of this board, which was obviously pretty frustrating as quarter saw and white oak is not cheap. And since the wood isn't cheap, and because this is only a project for myself, I had the idea that I could cut out the hole and fill it with basically one big inlay. Then I could use this as the inside of the cabinet and put the inlay towards the back, and with the shelves on the inside, I figured in the end you probably wouldn't even notice my little mistake anyway. So that's what you're seeing me do here, and is also a perfect introduction to the second tool in the series, my own router plane. I remember wanting to build a router plane early on, because I feel like it is a very versatile tool. Here I'm using it to hog out the waste of this big inlay, but I've also used it to cut rebates, grooves, dados, and other smaller inlays. I really do think it is an amazing tool and another great early tool to have in the shop. Anyway, after gluing in the inlay, cutting off the excess, and planing everything flush, I was left with a little fix that I was pretty happy with and that you'll see later on is pretty hard to notice. With the rest of the cabinet frame boards milled and fixed the same way, I could then move on to cutting some dovetails that'll hold the frame together. And as I cut these dovetails, I want to go back and share a little bit more of the story behind this cabinet. I had my plan to build my shop by building my own tools and started doing just that, and it was great. I loved building the winding sticks, loved figuring out ways to build the tools I wanted to build with the limited tools I had, and that was part of the fun of woodworking for me, solving problems that come up with the tools I have at hand. However, I felt myself over time begin to feel kind of frustrated or maybe more so tired of not having the right tools to be able to more easily accomplish different tasks. For example, the coping saw I use here to cut the bulk of the waste from between the tails isn't necessary per se. 
could cut the waste out with just a chisel, and I know some people prefer it that way, but having a coping saw just makes this process a whole lot easier and quite a bit quicker. And I know woodworking isn't just about getting the work done as quick as possible, unless maybe you're more so doing this for a living, but I do feel like something I've learned and part of the inspiration for the series I've done is that there just are some tools that really do make different tasks a whole lot easier and are just a lot of fun to use. And later in the video, I'll show two more plans that are a perfect example of tools that excel at specific tasks. But for now, I want to mention a few things as I finish up these dovetails. First, if you've ever seen my videos in the past, you'll know I've always used Japanese saws to cut my dovetails. But this time around, I had tried tuning up my back saw and thought I'd maybe get some better results with it. Well, unfortunately, I don't think I tuned up the saw well enough because I still struggled to use the back saw and eventually ditched it and cut the remaining dovetails with my Japanese saw. I think if I either tuned up the saw better or invested in a higher end dovetail saw, I would enjoy the western saws more because one thing I don't like about Japanese saws is that because they are so thin, I feel like they can have a tendency to wander a little in the cut, which can be pretty frustrating. But regardless, until I try tuning up my western saw again, I think I'm going to stick with the Japanese saws. The second thing I wanted to mention about these dovetails is that I usually can fuss a lot over my dovetails and stress about getting them perfectly gap free, but this time around I just went for it. And you know what? Some of them have some big gaps, but others look great. And at the end of the day, no one's really looking that closely, so I think I've really come to learn that stressing over the perfect dovetail just really isn't worth it. So after cutting the remaining dovetails, I can move on to cutting a rabbit along the back of the cabinet that will give room for the ship lap back and French cleat. A little bit ago I mentioned I'd talk more about two tools that excel at one specific task, and this rabbit plane, which is the third tool in the series, is one of those tools. A rabbit plane isn't a necessary tool, I could have cut this rabbit with my router plane, which I had to do for the short sides of the cabinet, but it takes a lot longer, there's more steps involved, and you have to be way more careful to get as exact of a cut. With the rabbit plane, however, all I do is set the fence the correct width and then keep playing until I reach my depth. Easy, simple, and it's a whole lot of fun to use. So could I have built this cabinet without first building the rabbit plane? Of course, but as is the theme of this video, by first building the rabbit plane, I felt like I was just able to enjoy the process more and had a better workflow because I had the right tools for the job. Now on the flip side of things, as I mentioned before, not having the perfect tool for every job provides fun opportunities to problem solve, and cutting the sliding dovetail is a great example. There's hand planes and router bits that can make this cut a whole lot easier, but I didn't have either of those. I also could have tried making these angled cuts by hand, but didn't yet really trust my skills to do so in an accurate manner. So I thought that clamping this angled block of wood and using it as a reference was a simple creative solution that made cutting a clean sliding dovetail super simple. Not as simple as a router bit or dedicated dovetail plane, but a fun solution nonetheless. I know I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth by saying I want tools to do specific tasks, but also enjoy finding creative solutions with the tools I have on hand. And I'll talk a little more about this later in the video, but I think what I'm trying to say is that as I've been growing my shop these last couple years, I've been finding I enjoy times when I get to be creative with my problem solving skills, but then find myself feeling like the creative problem solving is great and all, but having the right tool for the job would just feel a whole lot simpler and nicer. And that again is why I started this series and have built things like the router plane and rebate plane because I wanted to set myself up with the tools I needed to make my work a little simpler and overall just flow a little bit more. So after cutting the sliding dovetail, I could transfer the tail to the cabinet side and focus on cutting out the pin portion. Using the same angled block of wood as a reference again, I could establish an angled cut line on either side and then go in with a chisel and cut out the waste. Once the sliding dovetail was complete, I could use a very similar process for cutting out the stop dados with the shelves. This was a little easier though because I didn't have to deal with any angles so I could more easily chisel out the waste. Now before I cut the notches on the shelves, I needed to glue together the cabinet because I wanted to make sure I got the shelves to their exact widths based off the true width of the glued up cabinet. So after finishing all eight stop dados, I finished the inside of the cabinet and then glued everything up. As glue ups go, this was a relatively stress free one. The biggest concern I had was making sure it was square, which I accomplished by making sure the diagonal was the same when measured both ways. And after letting the glue dry, I could take off all the clamps and glue blocks, and then clean up the dovetails on all four corners. 
Overall, not all the dovetails were perfect, but I was still very pleased with how the majority of the dovetails came together. So as I said before, I wanted to glue up the frame first so that I could then be able to trim the shelves to their exact length, which is what you see me doing here. Once they are all trimmed to the right length, I could then finish the shelves by cutting the notches for the stop dados. So as I cut those notches, I've been talking in this video about basically my feelings for wanting to have the right tool for the job. And to elaborate more on that, one of the big inspirations behind this tool building series was wanting to have tools readily available to make building this specific cabinet a whole lot easier. I had the plans for this cabinet drawn up before I even started on the rebate plan, and as I was talking through what I would need to build this cabinet, I realized that if I took the time to make a rebate plane and a grooving plane, that would make building this cabinet way easier. So that's what I did, which naturally developed into the series you're watching now, and brings up the fourth and final tool in this series, the grooving plane. Out of all the tools in the series, I think this is my favorite for a couple reasons. One, I've cut grooves using just a chisel before, and let me tell you that wasn't fun at all. <laughs> I got the job done, but it took forever and did not come out as cleanly as using this grooving plane. So the first reason I love this plane is because it makes such quick, clean work. And the second reason I love this plane is that it's so fun to use. The dedicated fence and the dedicated depth of cut means I can cut very quickly, which creates a very satisfying sound. So overall, doing this series has solidified in me something I've felt for a while now, but I haven't really committed to yet. And that's taking the time to really invest in building a workshop better equipped to help me build the furniture I want to make. So it all makes me think of the story of two woodworkers, which, if I can share, goes like this. There was once two woodcutters who set out to see who could chop the most wood in a day. As the light broke on competition day, the first and older of the two woodcutters gathered his tools, sat down, and began the process of meticulously sharpening his tools. The second and younger woodcutter saw this and thought, this is my chance to get ahead, and immediately went out to begin working. After a while, the old woodcutter finished sharpening and set out as well. They both worked hard all day, and as the sun was going down, the young woodcutter gathered his wood, feeling confident in his hall. But as he returned to the cabin, his face fell, as looking to the older woodcutter's pile of wood, he saw that he had gathered twice the amount of wood. Maybe it's a little cheesy story, but one I heard a while back that has always just stuck with me. I'm a sucker for parable-like stories like this one, and what I like about it is that I feel like I can relate a little to the first woodcutter, in the way that when I really started getting serious about woodworking, I was so excited to start making stuff that I just jumped right into different projects with whatever tools I had on hand. Now I don't think this was a bad thing, because I had a lot of fun building different things, and I don't think there's a right way of starting into woodworking. But now that I'm a year into woodworking more seriously, I'm starting to see the wisdom in the older woodcutter that if I take the time to sharpen my tools, or in my case, invest in more shop-related projects, that I'll ultimately get to build more of the projects I want to build, and maybe have an easier time doing it. And the whole process of building this cabinet has been a great example of this. Something that made this cabinet really enjoyable was having the tools like the rebate and grooving plane to more easily accomplish different tasks. Looking back, I'm really thankful I took the time to build these tools to have what I needed to build this cabinet. And as I say that, you can see I'm getting to finishing touches of the cabinet. Cutting the hinges was a pretty stressful part of the project. I'd never done something like this before, and I would have been at a huge loss if it wasn't for one of Rob Kosman's videos, where he walked through installing button hinges like these. I'll put a link in the description, and if you ever have to install hinges like these, I highly recommend watching his video on this. These are a lot of helpful tips. In fact, Rob helped me a lot with this project in particular. He has a whole series where he basically builds the same cabinet here, but a little larger and without the shelves or drawer. But he walks through the same principles of building a frame, building a frame and panel door, and installing hinges. So a huge shout out and thanks to Rob for helping me make this cabinet. With the stressful job of getting the hinges installed, the door planned to fit, and the door pole installed, I could move on to finishing the drawer. For the drawer, I did a very traditional blind dovetail drawer with free floating wood bottom set in a groove. I'm not going to show a lot of the drawer construction. I think the best part was cutting these blind dovetails, which I had never done before and was pretty proud of how my first ones turned out. I think I actually find cutting blind dovetails easier than cutting full dovetails. Not sure if that is a common viewpoint, but it seemed like only having half the dovetail showing made it so that there was more room for error and a lot easier to hide some imperfections. Anyway. 
Once the dovetails were cut, the grooves cut, and everything glued up, I could then clean up the sides of the box and do some final fitting so that the drawer just barely fits. Finally, the last thing I had to do was cut the pieces to make the ship lap back. Once again, I got to use my rebate plan, which made quick work of cutting these grooves. And again, this is another great example of having the right tool for the job. Just made this whole process so much easier and so much more enjoyable having this rebate plan to use. With the rebates cut on each of the pieces of the ship lap back, I could then assemble the back. I placed glue along the perimeter pieces and then only placed a small dab in the center of each middle board to allow those to expand and contract as the seasons change. Then, using some playing cards as spacers, I spaced everything out as evenly as I could and used some blocks along the top and bottom to clamp everything in place. Then, finally, after some card scraping, I could put some tried and true finish on the outside of the frame and the cabinet was finally finished. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video of me building this wall cabinet. Really fun project for me. Hope you enjoyed hearing kind of some of the inspiration behind the series. Kind of hearing too some of my reflections just on my woodworking journey so far and my plans for what I'm hoping to do here coming up in the next year or so. And if you're watching this and wondering what this cabinet is for, well, my wife is really into essential oils and so I made it for her so that she can store all of her essential oils that she has. It's going to be really great to have this, going to be able to give some place for all these oils to go and it was just a fun small first project. So as I said in this video I'm working towards wanting to kind of build up the shop more. One thing you may have noticed is that I have better lighting in here now and thinking about doing a video on lighting if that's something you're interested in I'd love to make that help people out in the research that I did but overall, once again, just thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoy the video, and I'll see you in the next one.